Now we're going to look at another probability distribution. This is a distribution for a discrete outcome. In fact, a binary discrete outcome. And we'll call it the binomial. The setup for the binomial is as follows. We take random samples of a particular size, let's call that size M, from a large population in which the outcome of interest is binary. In other words, you can either get a one or a zero, or yes or no, or success or failure, and so on. M is frequently called the number of trials. And we assume that the trials are independent of each other. In other words, the outcome of one does not influence the outcome of any of the others. A canonical example is flipping a coin and counting the number of heads that we get. Let x equal the number of ones in a particular sample, say the number of heads in m trials. So how does x vary from sample to sample if we repeat the experiment a large number of times? In other words, how often do we find that x is equal to 0, or x is equal to 1, or x is equal to m? The relative frequencies of the possible values of x depend on a parameter. Often uh, we use the Greek letter pi to symbolize this parameter. And this is the population proportion of ones, successes. Say the experiment is to flip a coin four times and count the number of heads. We repeat this a large number of times. So what does the probability mass function look like for different values of pi? In other words, different values of the population proportion. I also want you to think about the following. Let's imagine that each of the six graphs that you see represents six different coins that we toss, but only one of these coins is fair. So which one is it? If we look at the first graph on the left hand side, where the population proportion equals 0.1, you'll see that the PMF, the probability mass function, has a highly skewed distribution. In fact, the most likely outcome is that we get no successes at all. We don't actually record any heads. As the population proportion increases, you'll see that the distribution gets more and more symmetrical. Already by pi equal to 0.4, you'll see that there is a marked symmetry there. And certainly, by the time we get to pi equal to 0.5, the distribution is symmetrical. Of course, when the population proportion is equal to 0.5, that represents the situation where we're dealing with a fair coin. The chances that we get a success or a failure are the same. As the population proportion goes up to 0.9, you'll see that again the distribution is highly asymmetrical. In the binomial distribution, the relative frequencies depend on m, the number of trials, and pi, the population proportion of ones. The probability mass function is given by this expression here. First of all, we have this curious term here, which I'll explain in a moment. And then you can see that we have the population proportion here raised to the power of x, where x is the number of successes, times 1 minus the population proportion to the power of m, the number of trials, minus the number of successes that we're interested in. Of course, x can range over the entire range of values between 0 and the total number of trials.
What about this curious bit of the expression here? What does this mean? Well, this is really just a little bit of shorthand. What mx within parenthesis means is the number of ways we can get x successes from m trials. We'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Two other things to note. The mean of x is going to be equal to m, the number of trials, times pi. And the variance of x is going to be equal to m, the number of trials, times the population proportion, times 1 minus the population proportion. Let's unpack this further by means of using an example. Let's say that 10% of the population are left-handed. In other words, pi is equal to 0.1. We take a random sample of four people from the population. M is equal to four. So, what's the probability that none of the four are left-handed? All four are left-handed. Exactly two are left-handed. At least two are left-handed. OK, let's consider the case where none are left-handed, where x is equal to zero. Clearly, there's only one way in which this can happen. The first person we select is right-handed, as is the second, as is the third, as is the fourth. OK, so let's plug the numbers into our formula here, our recipe. First thing on the right-hand side, how many different ways can this outcome happen? They can only happen in one way. OK, so that's dealt with this bit here. What about this bit here? Well, first of all, we need the population proportion, which we've been told. It's 0.1. And the power that we raise it to is 0. Anything raised to the power of 0 is equal to 1. That leaves us with this bit here, 1 minus pi, 1 minus the population proportion, which again is 0.1, raised to the power of m minus x. Well, m is equal to 4, and x is equal to 0. So if we just multiply all of these things together, we get the answer, which is 0.6561. That tells us what's the probability that none of the four that we selected from this population would be left-handed. We can also do this very, very easily uh, in R. And the code for doing that is at the bottom of the slide. OK, let's consider the second scenario in which all four are left-handed, in other words, where x equals four. Now, there's only one way in which that can happen. The first is left-handed, the second is left-handed, and so on through to the fourth, so that all of them are left-handed. OK, so now we plug the numbers into our recipe here. There's only one way in which the outcome can occur. The population proportion we've been told is 0.1. The exponent here is 4, and here we've got 1 minus the population proportion, m is equal to 4, and we subtract 4 away from it. So this exponent here is equal to 0, which effectively cancels this out here. This becomes 1, and we have 1 times 0.4 to the 4th times 1. In other words, simply 0.1 to the 4th which gives us a rather small number, this number here, 0 0.0001. And that is the probability that um, all four of the people that we select will be left-handed. The third scenario is that exactly two are left-handed. X is equal to two. Now we have to think a little bit more carefully. 
If we enumerate them, it turns out that this could happen in the following ways. The first two could be left-handed, and the second two not, and so on. It's relatively easy to enumerate all the possible cases, but of course you can see that it rather quickly could get out of hand. We actually need a recipe to tell us how many different ways there are to select exactly x of m objects when we don't care about the order that we choose them in. In other words, we're dealing with combinations as opposed to permutations. Luckily, there is one. This is the recipe that we need here m factorial over x factorial times m minus x factorial. Now in the textbooks you'll often see that using uh, different symbols, n rather than m and r rather than x, but it means exactly the same thing. These two expressions here are identical, they just use different symbols. Okay, let's explain this a little bit. Our idea is that we should choose two out of four. What does m factorial mean? Well, that's simply an instruction to multiply four by three, by two, by one. What does x factorial mean? That's simply an, an instruction to multiply two by one. And m minus x is also two. So again, we multiply two by one. If we simplify that, it comes down to 4 times 3 over 2 times 1, which equals 6. And that agrees with the enumeration that we made in the previous slide. Now we have everything that we need. What we're interested in is the relative frequency, in other words, the probability, of exactly x successes. In this case, x is 2 successes. This is going to be equal to the number of different ways in which we can get x successes. In this case, that's 6 times the probability of any given sequence. That's given by this part of the recipe here. And when we plug the numbers in by this part down here. If we work out what the product is, it will give us the answer. In this case, 0 0.0486. In other words, when the population proportion is 0 0.10, then the probability in four trials of getting two successes is approximately 0 0.0486. Let's now consider the final scenario, which is a little bit more complicated. What we're interested in now is whether at least two are left-handed. In other words, we want the probability that x is greater than or equal to two. Now, the easiest way is to calculate one minus the probability that x is equal to zero minus the probability that x is equal to one. And we already know the probability that x is equal to 0 because we've calculated it in one of the previous slides. That gave us a value of 0 0.6561. So what we need now is the probability that x is equal to 1. First of all, we have to figure out how many different ways can x be equal to 1. And the answer to that is simply 4. We could have a sequence 1, 0, 0, 0, or a sequence 0, 1, 0, 0, or a sequence 0, 0, 1, 0, or finally 0, 0, 0, 1. There are only four alternatives. As before, we plug the numbers into our recipe, and that gives us the answer 0.2916. In order to find out what we are really interested in, we need to subtract from 1, 0.6561 and then subtract from that 0.2916 and that will give us our answer which in this case is 0 0.0523. I want to finish with a historical curiosity. 
the Victorian polymath Francis Galton invented a piece of physical apparatus to illustrate the binomial distribution. You can see on the right hand side an example of it. The idea is that all bearings are dropped through this aperture here and then they fall through rows of pins. As they encounter each row of pins they either fall to the left which will count as a success or they fall to the right which will count as a failure. And the result of doing that as they go through each of the rolls at the bottom here the ball bearings um, fill up these columns and effectively count the number of successes and number of failures. In this particular piece of apparatus the number of trials is equal to the number of rows of pins which in this case is 10. Okay, so uh, here is a little simulation in R. Okay, so of the Galton simulation or in R. Or I'm using some code which I have borrowed from some I'm using people some who are a lot I smarter than me. Borrowed from some so let's just. Who are a lot smarter than me. So, so what I need here. Load up highlight the code we need and away oh, we go. Code we need and away we go. You can see the balls dropping through the golden box. The balls going either through left the or golden right. box. Going and either each left row or right. And then the totals accumulating at the bottom. Row and then the totals accumulating at the bottom. And there we have it, a roughly symmetrical <coughs> distribution. In this case, we had 15 rows corresponding to in this case, 15 trials, 15 rows and we dropped 200 balls through the machine. And we dropped 200 balls through the machine.